Coming up in this week's Swarf and Chips, I'm at Prototype Productions, and I'm gonna look at how you improve the production time on a component significantly thanks to one-hit machining. So I'm here with Joshua Tack at Prototype Productions. Joshua, this is going to be a great show because what we're going to illustrate is how you can make massive savings by one-hit machining. Now we're going to take this component and we're going to walk through the process of how you used to make it before you invested in the latest technology from Star GB. Now let's start where the machining of this part um, starts and, and tell me first the bar diameter that it comes out of and the material that it is and then Operation 1. So this is made out of inch and inch and eighth uh, EN 2040 uh, and it's approximately about five or six operations complete. Okay right now let's talk about op one which is done here on this Doosan Lynx 220. What do you do first Josh? So first it's on the Doosan Lynx, uh, it comes out to the stop, it's rough turn, finish turn, screw cut, grooved and then part off. Okay, now how long does that take in total to actually machine it? Because setup time's one thing, but the actual machining time as well. It's approximately about, about four minutes. Right, okay, now let's move on and have a look at operation two. So we've now moved down the shop, and bearing in mind the part would have to move as well, and that would include a member of staff having to bring it down here. What is operation two, and tell us how it's done here on this Kia machine? Okay, so operation two is putting a 5C collet on this Kia, as you can see. Uh, all the tools would have to be set, the clamping set, so it's not too tight but not too soft, uh, because it's going to then drill uh, about a 7.5mm drill, 65mm deep. Um, so spot drill, drill and tap, face and chamfer. Okay, and then that is operation two done. Now again, let's forget the setting time because it's a pain and, it, and it's a lot more than it is on doing it one hit machining. But how long does that take to machine that second operation? How long is that process? Uh, that's approximately two minutes. Okay, so we've got four minutes and we've got two minutes. Uh, four minutes and two minutes, which equals six. Uh, and that's operation one and operation two. Now then, this is where we really see massive gains, I think, of what we're going to look at how you're doing it now compared to how you used to do it. So the third operation would come on to here, this Bridgeport Vertical Machining Centre. And it, we should say at this point as well, there's more than one operation done on here for obvious reasons when you look at the part. Can you talk us through all the ops that are then done here to finish this component? Okay, yeah, so there's three operations on this Bridgeport. Uh, as you can see on this part, there are numerous holes and a flat as well, which are all in relation to each other. So that, that means we have to index, index it from the flat, which is then uh, the, the three holes are put at 180 degrees to the flat and is then rotated onto a fixture where that cross hole goes through the thread. So the first stop would be to machine your flat there. Then of course you have to use that flat to then uh, drill these holes or make these holes and then you use that flat once again then do you to then change it to uh, do that hole. So that's three operations on this machine, two on the other, so in total that's five ops to make this part. What's the machining time on here? That's roughly two minutes. Okay, so all of those setups in total, I'm calculating, here we go, four plus two plus two. Eight minutes to make that part previously. Now, uh, a few years ago, the company invested in this star sliding head lathe, this SR32J, and this is now where you make this component, importantly, in one operation, don't you? Can you tell us how you're doing it on this star lathe so people can uh, see the reductions that can be made and the ease of doing it in one hit? Yeah, that's it. So this is now complete on the SR32J. Um, so we do it in sections on here. Uh, because this machine is actually guide bush mode. Um, it's a little bit older than our uh, SR20J2, so it doesn't have the 
additional non-guide bush mode. Um, but basically we, we turn this first, uh, this first section, we screw cut it, we put the hole in, we then move on to this section here. Rough turn, finish turn, put the groove in, uh, cross, cross drill the hole, and same for the next three sections. So you're doing the three sections there then ind individually and you're moving them using the, uh, the guide bush basically then, aren't you, out. So does that maintain the same accuracy in, in doing that, do you think? Or you'd know, I suppose, from the results. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're, holding, we're holding eight microns on this part across from there all the way up to that shoulder. Okay, important point that because you're still having to hold eight microns when you did it in all those five ops as well. So how many would you often scrap because of the moving the part around the machine shop? Yeah, that's right. So probably say a batch of 100, maybe scrap 10 to 15 parts. Wow, 10 to 15% scrap, okay, which doesn't happen now for the reasons that we're talking about. Okay, talk us about then about the next operations once you've done what you just said there. Uh, what, once the holes and all these three sections are done, it's then rotated uh, and then milled this one flat here and rough turn, finish turn, this time to here. Once, once that's done, it's then parted off. Uh, head two comes over here, fix it up, and then it moves over to head two where same as the Kia, it's going to spot drill, drill and tap, face and chamfer, but all of that is done while head one is running. Okay, so what is the total cycle time then of one of these parts compared to what we came up with before, which was eight through all the five other operations? What are you making this on now on this machine? So now this is four minutes. Okay, so we've halved the cycle time. But it's not just about the cycle time here, is it? I mean, as important as that is, it's also about the fact that you, you were making potentially 10 to 15% in scrap components because you were moving them from one machine to the other. Um, wow, that's, that's tremendous. How much of these star machines have changed the course of this business, Josh? They've just been a real game changer, honestly. Um, I don't know where we'd be without them. Um, easy to learn and they're just, just great machines. And is there other examples within your machine shop? There must be, I'm sure, where you've made as significant a gains as you made here with this, where you've reduced cycle times by potentially 50%. Is this a common? Yeah, it happens quite a lot. I'd probably say at least 50% of the parts we do have got features where you've got holes, you've got flats that all are in relation to each other. So this is quite essential that we can now do this on the C-axis all in one hit. Unbelievable. There you have it. Um, it might sound straightforward. Often on Swarf and Chips we look at how people are making parts and the new technologies that can improve the way you make things. But it's only really when you visit machine shops and you witness it firsthand and you talk to the guys about the savings that they've made and how they've achieved it that you can really see the impact technology like this has from Star GB. So much so that you had a new machine here delivered uh, in about July this year which is the third machine they've got from Star over the course of the last five years. That's it for this week's Swarf and Chips. Uh, as always, like, comment and subscribe. And we always want to say uh, a big shout out to our sponsors, Interco, um, for our Swarf and Chips show. Join us again same time next week for another 10-minute topic.